Hello everyone, today is Thursday, January 19, 2017, and this is the week in charts. Okay, well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to be here. So what do we talk about? Well, as usual, let's talk about this stock market. And I guess the $64,000 question is, are we in a new bull leg? And I think we are, but there's always some caveats, and we'll take a look at those. Your questions on trading. Um, for now, while we're on the slides, keep them on the slides if you don't mind. And then, um, but yeah, feel free while we're on the slides. You can ask about anything you want, but uh, hold off on your stock picks until we get to the actual charts. And once we do that, if you don't mind, just ask about one stock at a, at a time. And that's for your benefit more than mine. Uh, so I could uh, delete the pick after we talk about it. We don't talk about it twice. And also, to make sure we get to all of your picks. So just hit one symbol and then hit return. This week I want to talk about being cognizant. At the end of last week's presentation, uh, as part of my random thoughts, I talked a lot about being, or a little bit about it, I should say, about being cognizant of your own emotions and how that can help you to embrace the emotions of others. And I really thought about that throughout this week. And, uh, I had a lot of discoveries or, or maybe even self-discoveries from that. And we'll dive right into that in just a second or two. And then I also have an example of when to bend the rules. As a general statement, you want to follow your methodology nearly to a T. But every now and then you could bend the rules a little bit and that might help you out. Now, it's a live example, so we don't know whether it's going to work or not. But I do like to use live examples. So next week I'd say, boy, that failed miserably. Oh, boy. Hopefully, that is, and I know I just used the word hope, but hopefully I'll say, you see, that worked out really nicely. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. As I often just like to sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I borrowed that line from my buddy, Greg Morris. Now, let's talk about being cognizant. And I poked around a little bit on the Internet until I found a definition that I liked relative to what we're doing. And cognizant is knowledge, knowledgeable of something, especially through personal experience. And that's an okay definition, but probably a better definition is being mindful of what you're doing. And that is vitally important. And I realized this week, my self-realization is how emotional I am with my trading, how tempted I am to do things that I preach against and how this would give us a lesson of the week in that we're all emotional beings and just because we decide to start trading doesn't mean that we're no longer human. And I'm going to flesh all that out in a few minutes. But some of the things I realized last week was just last week I monetized or mentally monetized open profits. And those are both on open profits and shoulda, coulda, wouldas. And we'll get into the shoulda, coulda, wouldas in one minute. But as I often preach, and I think somebody once said it, the moment you think about the money, you're dead. If you do think, start thinking about the money, you begin to mentally monetize it. By mentally monetize, I mean, it's okay, I could take that money and I could do something with it. I could buy a car, I could pay off a credit card, or whatever the case may be, pay a tuition bill, pay a tax bill, something along those lines. Once you start equating that money into money and money as money that could be applied to something, then you are you begin to attach something to the trade that doesn't belong. You really need to keep that trading account your trading account. I think that's as a side note, I'm just thinking like in Vegas, I was kind of thinking about poker players and how they probably can't think about the money when they're when you watch these um, things on TV and they're they're you know all in with a million bucks or whatever the case may be. But that's probably why casinos give you chips instead of letting you throw money on the table. I'm sure chips work a little easier, but one of the reasons is so you're not thinking about how much money you're actually throwing around. You start throwing around these chips like they're just free, and you, sometimes you forget how much money that really is. And, and I hate to use any gambling analogies when I talk about trading, but that's sort of like the same thing that happens 
And that's why they give you those chips in Vegas. So you're not thinking about the money and you spend more of it. But in trading, you just you can't think about the money. It seems like as soon as you do, you're, you're doomed. And then at one point last week, and albeit just briefly, and it was kind of interesting, this experiment that I did, and I'm always cognizant of what's going on. I'm always thinking about my feelings. So it gives me fodder for these presentations and to talk about things. Um, it's right, et cetera. But it's like last week I was extra cognizant of everything. And it made me think like, holy crap. I spent a lot of time worrying about the markets, worrying about positions. And then on top of that, because I'm a public figure and talking about stocks and positions, I find myself also worrying about the individuals that may have acted on my education. Let's just make sure I keep calling it education. And I was amazed at how emotional and how stressed and how, wow, I was really pretty stressed. I am pretty stressed in this whole thing. And again, as I said a minute ago, just because we have a pulse, just because you decide to trade doesn't mean you no longer have a pulse. And as I've talked about it many times, we're just simply not wired to trade. And I'm going to get into a little physiological, physiological, easy for me to say, things along those lines. But at one point last week, I actually did like a like a bipolar complete opposite of that stressed out worrying. And over a short period of time, a position or uh, several positions, I should say, begin to take off. And I actually found myself thinking this is easy, albeit briefly. And then I remembered how much pain I had earlier in the week. And I think that afternoon or uh, the following day, which was yesterday, I uh, the market began to hand me my ass once again and to remind me, humble me that, hey, it's not that easy. Longer term, you have to chip away at it. But shorter term, there's going to be a lot of ups and down. Now, last week, I took profits on a position and being extra cognizant of things, normally I would just take the profits and move on. But I did find myself watching the screen to see what happens next. And to, to think, could this be a trading lesson or how am I feeling about this? And by the way, it, it, if you want to really embrace trading, just start start really thinking about that, even though you might not tell anyone. But every trade you're in, while you're in it, before you get in it, while especially while you're in it and after you're in it, just say, what lessons did I learn? And one thing that I've been watching lately is how long or how much time the position spins underwater and how I'm tempted to pull the plug because it's like nobody likes to lose money. You, you're wired to avoid pain. So anyway, being cognizant, I think, is vitally important. So last week I took partial profits and I said, well, let me just watch this thing, see what happens next. And maybe this will become part of a, of a trading lesson. Then I got to thinking as I'm staring at the screen, as it goes a little bit higher, I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, this thing keeps going. And I took half the profits off. I'm only going to have a half a position on if this turns into the mother of all trends. Now, two minutes later, it begins to come back in. And then I begin to think, oh, crap, maybe this is the top. And now I don't feel like giving up the other half of those profits. And the lesson that came out of this is it made me put myself in, in people who might be following my money and position management style, my hybrid approach, being that we're taking partial profits and then we're trailing a stop and a remainder, it got me thinking that people who are following that are probably feeling the same thing. So it's like I, I allow myself probably to get a little too close to the markets, which I'm going to talk quite about a bit, ugh, quite a bit about in a minute. That's hard to say. And I found myself getting a little emotional. I got to thinking that, you know what? I bet a lot of people who are trying to implement this money management plan are feeling the exact same thing. And it made me realize that you can't have your cake and eat it too, although that's what I promote with this money management system. By taking partial profits, you're satisfying that short-term need. By keeping the position on, you're satisfying that longer-term self-fulfillment, self-actualization. I don't know what's wrong with my mouth today. That Maslow stuff. Don't worry, I'm not going to get too freshman psychology on you. But those Maslow's hierarchies of needs, 
So you're able to have your cake and eat it too. Well, it looks fantastic when you look at it in perfect hindsight, but while you're living through it, and again, me being extra cognizant this week of everything made me think about that. While you're living through it, you're putting yourself into a needless state of regret because it's a lose-lose situation. If the stock keeps going higher, the moment after you take partial profits, you're going to regret the fact that now you only have on half a position. If the stock starts coming back in, then you're going to regret by watching the screen too much. Then you're going to regret the fact that you didn't take uh, off all the profits. So that really kind of me kind of got me putting my putting myself um, into the shoes of somebody that's trying to follow the money management. And then it made me realize that, hey, whoa, Dave, you're watching the screen a little bit too much for whatever reason. Now, just last week, and I probably should write it down, and that's one thing that I, that I think I need to really mention to you guys today and girls, is probably the simplest thing you can do. I mean, everybody preaches trading journal, trading journal, trading journal. But I think go down... Uh, go to Wally World, get you a, or, or Dollar Store or whatever, get you a 99 cent notebook. And as much as you have a trading journal, maybe have an emotions journal. Now that sounds a little strange. But when you find yourself dropping an F bomb, ask yourself, am I following the system? And if you are following the system, then you need to find out why you're dropping that F-bomb. Now, are you watching the screen too much? Can you just simply walk away? Would that solve that problem? And as we'll get into in a few minutes, did you really pick the best trade to begin with? So every now and then, if you do find yourself being super duper emotional, you need to identify what's causing that. And the point I want to make you realize is we're all human, so you're not going to completely eliminate those emotions. And by the way, you can't because you would no longer be able to function as a human. And that's a reoccurring thing, obviously, in the weekend charts. So I know I dropped quite a few F-bombs. I didn't write down every time I, I dropped one. But I did find myself when I dropped one, I was like, well, why am I dropping this? What's going on? Am I still following the system? Did I just blow it? What's happening? And then that kind of helped me to realize that, hey, I don't want to make any unnecessary mistakes. We're all going to make some mistakes, and I'll show you one I made in a few minutes. And then obviously, I not only did I drop F-bombs, but so did a client. Now, this actually happened the week before. I got sent an email with an F-bomb, and it was because the positions were drawing down. And I'm sure he or some other client dropped an F-bomb too, because last week the positions were mostly drawing down also. So, when you have these emotions, you need to, these unnecessary emotions, getting upset, excited, whatever, unnecessarily, you need to figure out why you're doing that. And quite frankly, the simplest thing to do, and most of the time, is to just turn off your screen. Now, just last week, and maybe I, I did watch a screen a little bit too much last week, and that's something that I think I'm going to mention in just a minute or two. But I found myself in a state of regret for positions that weren't working. And worse, I began thinking, could this be the start of something bigger? Well, you have to take things one day at a time. But last week, last week the banks began to roll over a little bit. I certainly lost some steam. We had some hints of possible sector rotation in the works. Now, as a trend follower, you're going to be a little late to exit your positions, and that just comes with the territory. So if you do find yourself getting emotional about that, you just need to think, and it's hard, I know, but you need to think, okay, well, what's the worst that could happen? Well, the worst thing that can happen is I'm going to get stopped out in these positions, but if this market does keep rolling over, I know how to short. I'm not afraid to short. I'll start shorting the market. The market needs to go up. The market needs to go down. If the market goes sideways, that's not going to do you any good. But the market starts going down, that's a trend. And it's okay to be a trend follower and follow 
a market down. It's okay to short a market, okay? But you don't want to, especially as a trend follower, you don't want to move too fast. You want to move somewhere, you don't want to move like a, like a speedboat, but you don't want to move like a, a battleship, but it's a little somewhere in between. You want to be slow to make that turn because if it turns into the mother of all trends, it's okay if you miss a little bit of it. In fact, it's probably better that you miss a little bit of it just in case it turns into the mother of all fake outs. Now, in last week's chart show, at one point I talked about the fact that I went after position a couple times in a row, and it's um it's a bit of an intraday type of trade. I'm, 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 I know I preach against day trading, but it's a bit of an intraday type of trade that I follow in the currencies. And I told you guys that I got stopped out a couple times in a row, but it was setting up again, and I was going to go ahead and take the trade for the third time. And then after doing so, it immediately faced with an initial loss, not stopped out, but initial loss, I began thinking about the definition of insanity. And the definition of insanity, or one definition I should say, is doing the same thing over and over, but expecting a different outcome. And that reminds me of Cypress Hill, insane in the membrane, insane in the brain. But sometimes you have to be willing to seem a little crazy if you're truly following your system. You can't say, well, you know what, fool me twice. What's the old saying? You know, F me once, shame on you. F me twice, shame on me. So you got that in the back of your head, and you don't want to look like an idiot. Well, who cares if you look like an idiot, okay? We only have to answer to ourselves. Now, it gets a little tricky when, let's say, in trading service, we have a stock that stops out on a pullback or a trend knockout type of move, and it's actually set up for the next day. I'm always a little nervous putting it back in the service because I know that there is going to be some psychological baggage with getting stopped out either twice in a row in a position or making money in a position and then losing more than you made on the next trade if it turns into a loser. So it's kind of tough. So sometimes it's hard to do the right thing and not feel crazy. But I will say this, in trading, I see a lot of people do the wrong thing over and over and over again and expect a different outcome, okay? So that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying if you're losing money, just keep losing money, losing money, losing money. Figure out what you're doing wrong and then start doing the right thing, knowing that on occasion you will lose money. Now, again, just last week I found myself staring at the screen when I really didn't need to, okay? Now, I did that for a couple of reasons. I'm just kind of thinking out loud in my head. One is because I did kind of have this, this experiment going on, and I'm always cognizant of my emotions. Again, I know I've said that a few times, but I think last week I was extra cognizant thinking about what I would talk about today. And another reason I found myself getting staring at the screens a little bit too much is I'm working on some projects, and I kind of got stuck, and I need to get in. I need to bring in some outside help for a little help uh, to get me unstuck, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And since I was stuck, I was kind of like deer in the headlights. Like, okay, now what I do? I was like, well, let's let's start looking at the markets. Let's see what the positions are doing. And before long, I'm sitting here staring at the screen, doing what I preach against. And truth be told, I probably watch a screen more than I need to. But I do keep myself crazy busy to where I will go hours and hours and hours without watching a screen. And I think that's vitally important. In fact, with my methodology, busy traders make good traders. And, and maybe I've marketed my education too much towards the trader. And I really should be marketing my education towards the investor, the investor with a day job, well, especially. Uh, the professional who's has a busy day job. I don't want to digress too far. I know that's with me. That's nearly impossible, right? Thank God I named my column random thoughts. <laughs> but as I said, quite recently, this doctor friend of mine, who's also a client, he does very well in his trading. And then he begins to stumble a little bit. He overtrades a little bit. 
and then he draws down the account, and then he gets serious again. He does well for a while. It's kind of rinse and repeat. And he's been he's been with me for a long time on the service, and a lot of times he'll do really well on the service by following everything, and then he kind of slips back a little bit. He'll start overtrading. Uh, the ego will rear its ugly head, and for wh whatever reason, he'll do a little overtrading. And uh, he's I use him as an example quite often, but he's an awesome guy. Anyway, long story endless, as I said a few weeks ago, we were talking on the phone, and he says, you know, my trading has recently got a lot better. And he and he laughs after he said it. He goes, uh, he goes, no, I didn't discover anything new. My uh, One of my doctors quit, so now I'm working in the office during the day, and now I have to pick up her shift in the hospital. He actually emailed me last week and said, you know what, my trading's still doing great because I'm too busy to take mediocre trades. So that's what's going on is I do believe that busy traders make good traders. So again, last week I found myself staring at the screen a little too much for whatever reasons. As someone once said, you have to be as close to the market as you need to be with no close. I need to reread all these market wizard books and figure out where all these quotes are coming from. I think most of them come from market wizards. Uh, I did reread re a little bit of one a while back. And one thing I realized is, is huge, as huge fan as I am of these books, they, there is a little gunslinging involved with some of these guys to where I think they could easily blow up. And I guess some of them have since. I mean, we're all, none of us are immune to that black swan, but I think if you, when you reread them, there's a little excitement in their gunslinging. You certainly don't want to be trading at, at these ridiculous sizes and you got to be really careful. So that's one thing when I did start to reread them a little bit, so don't necessarily use that as your Bible, but use that as to get a little, uh, a few of these little, uh, little gems, these little quotes, these little tidbits about what you should do. But don't try to be a gunslinger like some of these guys where they, they go for the throat. I think that's very dangerous. So somewhere in Market Wizards, I know I digressed again, but somewhere in Market Wizards it said, or one of these books, be as close to the markets as you need to be but no closer. And that watching in the screen will cause you to do a lot of things that you don't, that you should not be doing. And you have to realize we have this little panic monster inside of us. And I'll tell you where he lives in just one second. And you got to be careful not to wake him. And I think one easy way to wake him is to, to watch that screen too much. This is um, this is my own drawing, but I but I ripped off uh, I didn't rip off I borrowed it from uh, waitbutwhy.com. And if you get on YouTube and poke around a little bit, this guy does a really good uh, presentation, one of these TED talks, where he talks a little bit about the panic monster, and it's it's quite entertaining. So I would strongly urge you watch that. Now, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the when I refer to the panic monster is the part of our brain known as the amygdala, the lizard brain, a part of the, the limbic system. Now, I'm not a neurosurgeon, or a, nor do I play one on TV, and, and occasionally I stay at a Holiday Inn Express. But the point I'm trying to make is that scientists disagree fully on, on what encompasses the amygdala and how big it actually is. Uh, so I think we're getting bogged down, or they're getting bogged down in semantics. The bottom line is, it's the part of our brain that makes snap very fast decisions. And I've written about it fairly extensively, and you can dig around my website and find quite a bit on that, and also in these YouTubes, uh, if you're watching a recording of this. But it's actually these two Almond-shaped parts, almond-shaped parts of our brain. It's on both sides of the brain. Some scientists say it's more like a chestnut, but who cares, you know? And some say it's a little bit more involved. I think the limbic system is up in here, too. It's part of this. But the, the bottom line is it's not a very big part of our brain. And that's by design because it's designed to work really fast. You touch the hot stove, you don't want to sit around and think about that. A cab's flying at you. 
at 30 miles an hour on a New York street. Uh, that's an exaggeration. It'd probably be more like 50 miles an hour. But anyway, you don't want to stop, as I've said quite often, you don't want to stop and say, oh, does this guy like me? I wonder why he's driving so fast. You don't want to contemplate your navel. You want to jump out the way. So this, this is really necessary for survival. And it has a lot of caveman attributes to it, the flight of fight thing. And we really need it. So you have to embrace your amygdala. You have to realize that from not only a psychological standpoint, but from a physiological standpoint, there are things that get in the way of your trading. We're simply not made to trade, but that's okay. We can embrace that. We can live with that. So you don't want to wake the panic monster. And that's where the panic monster lives. And this is the little part of your brain that's, that controls your emotions or where your emotions come from. And what you have to do is you have to, you have to tiptoe past the panic monster. And where I got that line of reasoning was from Dr. Robert Mara, who, was, who spoke at a conference, which I'll talk about in just a minute, uh, a few months back. And a couple of the attendees said, if you don't read any of his books, read this one. I have to look, I have to look for his other books too. But I read this book a, a few months back, and you heard me talk about it. In fact, I mentioned it last week. I couldn't remember the name. It's The Kaizen Way, One Small Step Can Change Your Life. And by the way, I don't want to digress too far. I know, imagine that. But now's the time to read this book. I need to get my book uh, references up again on my website. So I don't get any compensation for this. If I had my book Amazon links back up, I would. But this is just simply, I think you should read this book. And the bottom line is, I'm sure a lot of you guys have already ditched a few of your New Year's resolutions. And I didn't make any other than some business things, okay? But uh, I didn't make any health and diet and things like that ones. And I'm just going to take some small steps towards getting better and continue to do a lot of things that I do and maybe a little bit less of things I don't. But the reason you should read it right now, especially with New Year in front of us, is that he talks a lot about things like how little small changes make all the difference in the world. And an example he gave was this woman that could never lose weight. And, she, and one reason was because she never wanted to exercise. And he found out through a session that she watched a lot of TV. He said, okay, well, here's the thing. Tonight, while you're watching TV, any, anytime you feel like it, I want you to stand up and march in place for one minute. And that's all I want you to do. Pre, prior doctors gave her an exercise regime, regime, and she joined gyms, and she's done all these things, and, and maybe even had a trainer for a day or two. And none of it worked. And it's like, okay, well, let's, you know, she starts thinking that maybe I could do things for just one minute a day. You have to train your brain. So in training the brain, it's like your brain is resistance to change. We have this homeostasis about it, which he talks a lot in the book, where our bodies want to stay in a certain state. And it's very hard to get them, get your body into a new state. So if you're failing in some kind of massive New Year resolution, you're not alone, okay? Because your body wants to continue to do what you were doing. So he talked this woman into marching in place for one minute a night. As silly as that sounds, well, you're not going to embrace or you're not going to wake up the panic monster. You're not going to have all these emotions by just standing up for one minute a night. It's kind of like um, the panic monster just kind of sleeps while you do that. And before long, the woman started marching during every commercial break for the entire commercial break. And then I forget exactly where she went from there, but it was a great success. She might even went on to run races and things like that. So you have to embrace that amygdala and then figure out a way to tiptoe past the panic monster. So getting back to trading, it could actually be fairly easy. I know. Hard to believe, right? Is it as easy as one, two, three? And I think you really have to embrace your amygdala and know that we have this physiological attribute that keeps us alive, that allows us to function as normal human beings, but can also get in the way of our trading. So one thing I like to do is often say, be cognizant of your emotions in trading, but also be cognizant 
of your emotions in life and embrace what emotional creatures we really are. In fact, we have to be emotional creatures. It's just how we're made. So, and I think I've said this before, but the next time you find yourself getting ready to have an emotional reaction to your spouse or significant other, all you have to do is count to three. It only takes about three seconds. It probably only takes about a second and a half, but I would give yourself at least three seconds to get past that emotional part of your brain. How many times have you snapped at your wife or significant other? And as I've said quite often, it's like you can almost see the words going towards their face and then their face beginning to frown when you're like, no, and it's like it happens all in such slow motion. Now, as I also mentioned, I told my wife about this, and, and she kind of chuckled and thinking, yeah, you know, you, you really follow that advice because I've snapped a few times uh, fairly recently. And I thought to myself, you have no idea how many times this has saved my ass. <laughs> you, should, you know, so I didn't want to get into that conversation. Because, By the way, be careful with hypothetical conversations with your, wife, with your wife. I know what would the world be without hypothetical questions. But like, for instance, if, you're, like if your wife says, hey, if, um, uh, you know, hypothetically speaking, if you ever thought about a three-way, who would it be with? Well, just make sure that you include your wife as one of those women, okay? But uh, that's, I stole that from, um, he said, everybody loves Raymond. He was, what's his name? Ray Brown? He said that once on TV. But anyway, uh, be careful of these hypothetical questions. Anyway, before I digress too far, just last week, I found myself in a trade that I did not fully plan ahead of time. Now, I fully planned the trade, I fully planned the getting in, I fully planned the entry, but I didn't really think about where the stop should go. And then it, it was going against me a little bit initially, and I wasn't really too worried about it. And then it really began to take off. Well, I had the initial stop in place, but I didn't think about how I wanted to trail it, and keep in mind, this is this is a, an intraday type of position that I try to work into a swing trade. Just like we with the stocks, I try to work a swing trade into a longer term trade. With the forex trading, because the markets are more efficient, I try to get in on a intraday basis on an hourly chart, and the, the goal is to work up to a four hour and then a daily chart on those and to establish yourself in daily trades. I don't recommend doing that in stocks. We talked about this a little bit last week. The reason I don't is because um, stocks are more e inefficient, and I think you're better off not trying to, to go down to the micro level. I think you can end up overtrading. But in Forex, especially if you're waiting for longer-term patterns to occur, when that inefficient move is more likely to occur, I think you're better off with that type of trading. And that's I know that's fodder for another um, – conversation. That's why I'm doing that. So, but I found myself wondering, well, how do I trail this stop and do I, what's my time frame now? Because I am doing that transition. It is a little bit more complex than what I'm doing. So I did find myself during the heat of battle trying to figure out what my plan is. As I said before, wife walks in the office once and she's like, uh, you know, what's wrong? What's going on? I said, well, it's a good problem. I said, you know, I'm in all these positions, but I don't know what to do. And she's like, well, what would Dave Landry do? And then she walked up my office. I was like, okay, well, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do what Dave Landry would do. I'm going to make sure those stops are in place. I'm going to trail those stops uh, in the future. I'm going to make sure I plan the trade ahead of time so I know what to do and I'm not so stressed out in heat of battle. Now, in addition to be cognizant of yourself, it also helps to be cognizant of others. So yesterday I had a business call with someone and we were both we were both really busy and it's like, hey, you got a few minutes? Yeah, but just a few minutes. And I'm, yeah, same here, but I really need to talk to you. I'm having some, uh, I need some advice and some things. And um, he was glad to accommodate, but I knew we were both on schedule. And as soon as we got into our business meeting, he's like, whoa. And I'm like, what? And he's like, well, what's happening in currencies? And I got all excited initially. I'm like, oh, shit. You know, so 
Initially, I got all excited, like, what is happening? So there I go back to the screen again to see what's happening. And he's excited, and then I'm dropping F-bombs, you know? So he's like, yay. <laughs> and I asked him, I said, are you long or short? He goes, I'm long. And he's like, what are you? And it's like, I'm short. And here's a guy who I, who I respect, and he has the complete opposite position as me. Now, we were in a hurry, so I didn't get into the details of why he was long and I was short. And then part of me was thinking, maybe I don't want to, because I find that if someone I respect, respect has an opposite opinion of me, then it kind of confuses my analysis a little bit. So, um, so I don't know. I mean, I guess that's the obvious question. It's like, what was he following? What was I doing? Okay, well, I was just doing these bow ties off an hourly chart off of multi-year highs. That's what I was doing to short. And I'm not sure what he was doing, intraday or position trading or whatever. But regardless of whether you actually get to talk to that guy on the other side of the trade or not, this reaffirmed, again, being cognizant of everything happening to me trading-wise last week, this made me realize, again, what does the guy on the other side of the trade know? Now, from a general standpoint, you need to be cognizant of how others approach the markets, okay? And maybe this is maybe this goes a little bit towards more of the investor versus the trader. So here's another trader who had an opinion the complete opposite of mine, and here I am thinking that I my position should be working. Why is this working now? What's going on? But you also have to be cognizant of the other players that are in the market. So you're probably wondering why is there Chewbacca there with a costume that appears to be falling off. I went to uh, a costume party last Saturday, and while at the costume party, it's kind of funny, you know, I'm in a Chewbacca outfit, and we're talking markets. And then, <laughs> and at one point, I was literally talking to a guy dressed like a clown. It's like, you know, Chewbacca and, and a clown sitting there talking markets. But one of the guys that was there, um, I think all we really have in common is the market. So whenever he sees me, he starts talking markets. And he asked me what I thought, and um, this could probably be another column or, or presentation in and of itself. But I said, well, I think the market's okay. We're consolidating a little bit, but so far it's going higher. And um, he told me that, well, I got out a while back, and he didn't say exactly how long, but I think it might have been a year, because I thought it was high. And because, you know, I'm mostly retired, and my youngest is nearing college age. So the question is, what does that have to do with the markets? Okay. Now, you could argue that it's high could be part of the markets, but how do you define high? Did the market look high in 2011? Did the market look high in 2013, you know, 14, 15, 16, now 17? You know, how do you define high? Okay. And that's what trend following is all about. It's like the hokey poly, pokey. That's what it's all about. Just you follow along. You don't try to judge whether it's high or not. But the point is that people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons. So as I often talked about, my friend Dick Fruth often says when he was back at a broker way back in the days when people will actually come in and hand the shares, he would ask them, hey, why are you selling your stocks? And people would say, well, I'm getting divorced. Or, yeah, I'm getting divorced. I don't know which case it might be. Um, there was a death in the family. We're trying to settle the estate. Uh, the aforementioned reason of my kids going to college. That's a, that's a great reason to sell stocks, right? Uh, or retiring, as a friend of mine was or is. Buying a house might be a good reason, okay? So, again... If you notice, none of these reasons had anything to do with the underlying capital. And again, this is Dick Fruth kind of got me along this line of reasons from um, Fruth Capital Management over in Houston, Texas. And as I often say, the the big epiphanies, or the minor epiphanies at least, that 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 I get from the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts is that it's not some gee whiz indicator or way of looking at the markets or thinking about the markets, but more of like 
general small things that reaffirm how the market works. It reaffirms that people sell stocks for a variety of reasons. And Tom McClellan says, when you buy a stock, you form a relationship between you and the company. And you're expecting the company to do great things. And you're expecting the CEO, although occasionally it happens, but you're expecting the CEO not to sexually harass his secretary, as it did happen. Uh, and that company lost a, a boatload of money. And I think that happened right after I published Layman's and kind of hinted that that could happen. So I wonder if that was... I wonder if I jinxed him or whatever. But anyway, that's another story altogether. But as a general statement, a company has your best interest in mind and has the company's best interest in mind. Unfortunately, though, you're also building a relationship or forming a relationship with anybody who bought that stock prior to you. And as Tom McClellan went on to say, and those people will screw you. And then I told Tom, as I've said many times before, just such this is such good stuff, though. I, I cannot emphasize it enough. And it helps me personally from an own uh, psychological standpoint. Whenever I get pissed off, it's like, okay, why am I mad at someone that I don't know or a market, this emotional being that I have no control over? And it helps you to kind of wrap your head around it. And I told Tom, I said, Tom, I've been quoting you like crazy. And he says, as far as quotes, my late mother, Marion, had a great one. She said, everyone uses time in their investments. Some people buy when they have money and they sell when they need money, while others use methods that are more sophisticated. So I think that's just a great quote to remember. So the point is that people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons, and many of which have nothing to do with the underlying company. So as I often say, you're dealing with a bunch of emotional beings, and one of those emotional beings is you. Being cognizant of your own feelings will help you wrap your head around how emotional everyone else is. And that's, I tell you, for me, this, this experiment this week made me realize how really emotional I am. I know I'm emotional. I mean, I cry like a schoolgirl if you force me to watch a Nicholas Sparks movie. But I didn't realize how emotional I was when it comes to the markets. Now, one thing I was reminded of, I was in Vegas a few months back uh, speaking at Traders for a Cause presentation or, or seminar, and uh, most of those guys are day traders. In fact, nearly all of them are. And one guy got up and reminded everyone, that you're trading traders, not markets. And I, I've forgotten that quote, and that's a really good quote. And it kind of brings me to uh, Mark Douglas, the late, great Mark Douglas. He once said, all it takes is one a-hole to scoop a perfectly good trade. And I spoke on Sunday at this conference, but on Saturday they had a lot of little small talks, and then they had uh, Dr. Robert Mara come in and talk to us and a few other people. And the traders that were talking, a lot of times they, they, they mentioned the shorting the parabolics. Well, I didn't realize that the shorts did this so much. I often say that shorts tend to be egotistical and they short markets because they're high. I didn't realize that that was like one of their main strategies, like when a stock goes parabolic, they pile on it as a short. So in my next day of my presentation, it's like, hey, <laughs> all it takes is one a-hole to screw up your trade. And you know what? I buy a lot of these stocks and hope they go parabolic, especially something that's in a TKO and a strong uptrend, which we'll, we'll have an example of in one second. It's nice to know you. It's nice to know the guy on the other side of the trade. Now, here's the thing. And this comes back to being cognizant. Could you be the a-hole? Okay. I'll give you an example of me possibly being the a-hole. Last week, I fat-fingered a trade. Now, I don't think that my fat-fingering a trade is going to... I don't think my fat-fingered trade screwed up anyone as a small private trader. But it can. And uh, by fat finger, I mean I put an order in. And at the end of the day, I was like, okay, well, I know I didn't get filled on that one because it didn't hit my uh, my entry price. And then some for some reason, it was in the account at the end of the day. I'm like, oh, I didn't mean to do that. I must have forgot. To, I must have put limit or something instead of a stop order. Now you're thinking, okay, again, you know, yeah, Dave, big Dave, you're really pushing the markets around. Well, just a few weeks back, I had a client that was getting fills, and we had to figure out why he was getting the fills he was getting. And... He was getting fills outside of the market 
But when you looked at the times and sales, we were looking through time and sales, his trades became legitimate trades on the tape. So his trades, even though they were, they were smallish type trades, they still could, uh, they still were making prints. And those prints could actually trigger stocks. So remember that people making mistakes can, can screw you up or people doing things, following their own systems can screw you up. People who are exiting because their kids need to go to college could screw you up. So you have no control over these people. So here's a couple of takeaways from all this. Being cognizant, again, of your own emotion gives you tons of introspection and helps you to understand the other people that are out there. The main question you need to ask yourself, are you planning the trade and trading the plan? Now, I know it's a little cliche, but it's vitally important that you plan that trade ahead of time and don't find yourself in the heat of battle thinking, well, what should I do? Where should my stop be? How should a trailer stop? What should I do? Have that all done the night before. Now, one lesson this week is, are you too close to the market? Okay. Could you possibly be a little bit more like Ron Papil's Showtime Rotisserie 2000 and set it and forget it? If you have a stop in place, now this is provide the markets far away from your stop, or far enough away, at least outside the normal volatility, then there's nothing to do other than honor your stop. So again, be as close to the market as you need to be, but no closer. Now, another takeaway this week is you have to embrace the imperfect nature of the markets, your system, and yourself. I was looking for that uh, Cypress Hill picture early this morning, and I got an ad for a Forex system that you're going to make millions. He actually said that's like, a, it's like, imagine if I gave you a treasure map. Would you open it up? If it only took 15 minutes a day, it's like, oh, my God, these guys out there that are selling this shit, you know? Um, I probably should buy it just to see what it is. I mean, who knows? Maybe it'll work and you never see my fat ass again, but <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt seriously, okay? If you have a, a, a goose that lays golden eggs, why would you sell a goose? Hey, but Dave, aren't you selling a system? Well, I'm selling a general methodology. I'm selling a general framework, but I don't have all the answers. And guess what? No one does. If they did, they would own the markets, Okay. So I have an imperfect system, and, and I flat out admit it. I'm one of the only guys out there who actually show you losing trades, okay? You can watch all the trades if you get, get under the late service for free and, and see everything we do. And by the way, I've been working to update those, keeping them more updated. Uh, sometimes what happens is we have a lot of positions that don't trigger, so I don't update it for, for days, and sometimes I can turn it to a week or so. And then uh, at the least, check my homepage because I try to put the most current one that doesn't have uh, pending positions open out of courtesy to my uh, paying clients. So at least check the homepage of my website and click and watch that service. But you'll notice there's one losing trade, at least in it now, open trade. So the point is, I don't have the holy grail. I'm working on it, but I know I'll never find it, but that's okay. So you have to embrace the imperfect nature of the markets because they're not going to behave in the way you want them to behave. Trust me. You have to embrace the imperfect nature of your system, okay? I would rather have a mediocre system that tested out longer term meet in a mediocre manner over a long, long period of time than some system that looks like it prints money over well, a short period or a long period of time because that, that system that appears to be more perfect has – curve fit to prior conditions. I know it sounds a little counterintuitive, but trust me, if someone shows you a system that's just unbelievably correct and never has a drawdown, that thing is, is a recipe for disaster, okay? Whereas something a little bit more mediocre is probably more realistic and sustainable. So again, markets aren't perfect because some guy selling, some guy's fat finger to trade, some guy's putting in, a, in the wrong order or he or his broker, he didn't understand how his broker executes the orders and he's getting fills when he didn't want them, okay? So it's an execution issue, a mistake, an execution issue. 
something like a kid going to college, retiring, death, estate sales, uh, settlement, etc. So markets aren't perfect, but that's okay. Imperfect nature of markets, the emotional nature of markets actually works to your advantage. It creates trends and then specific setups such as like a trend knockout that has a psychological backing behind it. So embrace your system. Again, it's not going to be perfect, but if it's conceptually correct, if you're following the trend, and trends do exist, they always will exist, okay? Might get a little choppy here and there, but longer term, stocks will go up and stocks will go down. It's one of the few things I can guarantee. And then, of course, the imperfect nature of yourself. Realize how emotional you are, how emotional you are, but that you cannot function as a normal human being if you weren't, if you didn't have those emotions. Now, sometimes you need to go back to the beginning. Once you're in a trade, and as I often say, I always do a post-mortem when you trade. Go back and do a post-mortem. I don't do one right away. It might take me a while to get to it. But until you become consistently profitable, you definitely want to make sure you're doing it on every trade, every trade. Um, and then usually I'll do it. I'll go back and look at things longer term, maybe after six months or so. And as I often say, if you ever find yourself saying, what the hell was I thinking, which you will, no matter what, but I find myself saying it less and less because now I'm being more and more selective. In fact, uh, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm able to catch up that service, those delayed services, just a few days ago is like we went a week or two without any setups. And that's because I was being very, very selective. The market was chopping sideways. So I had needed the mother of all setups to go in while the market was chopping sideways. And then the database just wasn't producing that much to begin with. So go back to the original trade and ask yourself, was it intuition or intuition? And that's another gem that I think I got from Market Wizards. Now you got to ask yourself, did you really pick the best and leave the rest? So as I often preach, a good offense is often your best defense. If you're in the best stocks to begin with, you're going to get stopped out less. And then as I often say, when it comes to mind methodology and methodology, it's the, I'm sorry, mind methodology and money management, the three are intertwined. If you're picking the best to begin with, you're going to get a few winners under your belt. You're going to feel good about those winners. And when a loser comes along, it's stinking up the joint, and you know to honor your stop and kick it out so you could put more winners in. So now your methodology has gotten better. Now you're feeling better. And now your money management has gotten better. So if there is a holy grail, it's picking the best stocks to begin with. And as I often say, one new improved stock pick or avoid a bad pick. And that's one thing that I've been talking about quite a bit is you could avoid a lot of losing trades with a lot of simple things. Just like don't take a trade if it's got a lot of overhead supply. Watch the one hour free video that I have on the stock selection page for more on that. Uh, with any course that I do, you have unlimited lifetime support, and then you can have access to all course upgrades and related live events. So what that means is, especially like right now, I'm implementing a learning management system, which is going to be uh, above and beyond anything that I've done so far. It's going to be the same information, but it's going to be presented in a much better way. And I've been doing a little studying on that, and, and we're going to put that, we're going to roll out on the website. Hopefully over the next few weeks with the next course we roll out, which will be the intro uh, introduction to trading course and then you'll get to see that so anytime I upgrade a course uh, there hasn't been a lot of new information I've been collecting a lot of examples on a lot of things like the IPO course for instance uh, nothing's really changed so I put that out a couple years ago the patterns are still working knock on wood uh, working well in some cases so there's nothing earth-shattering that I have to redo other than I think we could polish up the course a little bit maybe put some new examples in there and then add a few more of these learning management things in to make it better. But anyway, anytime I upgrade a course, uh, you get access and occasionally I'll do a live event uh, or anytime I do a new course, I'll do some live events with it. You'll get access to those too. So again, at the least you want to watch the free video. So I've got to thinking whenever I think about, whenever I think about pick the best, leave the rest, it's like it's one thing to tell you about something in theory, but you also need to see it in action. Okay. So if you get the course, I'll give you a year free to my trading service from the day you buy the course. So that'll be 14, that's normally $14.97 a year. That's a yearly price of the service. 
you'll get the course free. I'm sorry, you get the service free. That way, you could learn how I pick stocks and then actually see it. By the way, one thing that's cool is in the in the sir in the stock selection course, I'm, I show you how I pick the stocks. We did it on a weekend, and then after I got through teaching, we went through the database and, and I found stocks, and then most of those took off. And that spreadsheet's on that uh, stock selection page, so check that out. I can't guarantee it always works that way. In fact, you know, if I acted like it did. I'd probably sell a lot more courses. But again, the imperfect nature of the methodology is why the methodology works. I know it sounds a little counterintuitive. Um, kind of have a closing random thought on being cognizant. One thing that has been crucial for my success in life has been, and again, I, I'm, I'm guilty of not giving people proper credit, but I think this was Anthony Robbins that said this, so I'm going to give him credit, and hopefully I'm, I'm giving the right person credit. If you don't know what to do, especially since I got snagged on some issues this weekend, uh, or this week and weekend, uh, with business, ask yourself, if you don't know what to do, what would you do if you knew what to do? In other words, if you don't know what to do, but if I did know, this is what I would do. And I think that helped me in my, uh, when I did a little bit more institutional type of consulting. And uh, one guy who I actually stayed with for 14 years, he said, you know, Dave's not always right, but he's going to always tell you what he thinks. Uh, often wrong, but never in doubt, okay? And I think that's important. If you don't know what to do, then say, okay, I don't know what to do, but if I did know what to do, this is what I'd do, okay? If you don't know where to put your stop, then ask yourself, well, if I did know what to do, this is what I'd do. And I would put it here because of the volatility of the stock. I don't want to get stopped out on noise alone. So, that has really helped me throughout life, and that's why uh, you'll see in some of the testimonials that I have on my website, especially like the professional testimonials, is like, Dave's not always right, but he's he's right more often than he's wrong. And that's because I, I give it a, a great part to this quote right here. If I, don't, if I didn't know, if I don't know what, I don't know what the market's going to do, but if I did know what the market's going to do or what it's likely to do, what would it be? And that's really helped me. A lot. So that's kind of a random thought on all this, and I'm not sure how it all ties in. Uh, real quick, uh, this is a position coming into today, and this is where I bend the rules a little bit. Oh, keep the questions coming. We're going to get to those in one second. Um, usually, I'll totally ignore a position if it has a gap, especially one of this size. But what I liked about this particular stock was a couple things. One, it was in a decent trend, and I don't know why it won't draw. Oh, there it is. And then that trend began to accelerate higher, as you can see. And you can't see the scaling on the right, but that's a very significant move higher that it made. And that's why I'm not too worried about it pulling back close to this base in here, because this thing just skyrocketed higher. Two, it's a commodity-related stocks, and sometimes these commodity-related stocks can get whacked pretty hard because of the choppy nature of the underlying commodities. So this is why I decided to go with this as a setup. So sometimes you can bend the rules, and that's okay. Um, but if you are going to bend the rules, and I should have another slide in here, but I'll have to find it. Uh, let me just tell you off the top of my head. If you are going to bend the rules, then make sure you're, you get good at following the existing system first. Make sure you get disciplined in that before you look to exercise some discretion. So usually I will totally avoid a stock that has a big gap. In this particular case, I like the pattern. It was in a sharp uptrend. If you look at like a two-day chart, it's like a two-day TKO, which erases that gap, which is kind of a um, kind of a cool thing to look at. Anyway, that's why I did that. Uh, as I hinted to earlier, I'm working on a learning management system, and I'm hopefully that we'll start rolling that out really soon, maybe over the next few weeks. And the introduction course will be the first thing to um, to come out of that. And you'll get the uh, – I'll, I'll, I'll give away some of the beginning of that so you get a feel for what's actually in it. And once again, make sure you're under delayed service. Now, as I say each week, um, 
Good traders make quick decisions. So if you're on a delayed service for over a year and you looked at the last 10 years archives or whatever, you're thinking that you still don't know whether you want to trade or not uh, this system, uh, you probably shouldn't be trading. You know, I'm not a tough love kind of guy, but maybe I should be a little more tough love kind of guy judging from um, some of these things. So, but if you, if you can't afford to be on a service and you just want to learn about markets, then uh, by all means, let me know and I'll keep you on a delayed service. I'll make a note on your account so you can stay on as long as you want. There is a, co a cost to all these things, obviously. Got any questions, anything, shoot me an email, and then obviously check out the free stuff on my website, okay? Now, we've got some questions coming in. Let's see what we can do. All right, Angelo says, I can't do it. It's all about the money. Well, I hear you, Angelo, and, and that's something that you're going to have to wrap your head around. And the easiest way to do that is to trade at a size that's almost meaningless, okay? Um, I'm not a big golfer, um, but I occasionally play golf, maybe once every. I used to say I could only go, I could I only let myself go once a year, but it, geez, I hadn't played golf probably 10 years. Um, but trade at a size that might monetize to a game of golf, maybe a hundred bucks, 200 bucks, I mean, depending on where you're playing. We've got pastures around here, pretty cheap, but uh, you get the idea, or maybe a nice meal, or something, or whatever, to where it it might aggravate you a little bit if you lose money, but it's not the end of the world. So that's one way you don't think about the money is to trade at a size that's almost meaningless until you get the reps in, the reps in of doing the right thing, the reps in of embracing your emotions, of following the system, of fat fingering a few orders, um, and things like that on things of that nature. No health and diet goals explains the big fat ass. Hey, watch it. Well, you're a client. You can say what you want, I guess. <laughs> uh, all right, Shiva, we'll get to that as soon as we get to the charts. Absolutely. That's a good question. All right. In fact, speaking of the charts, let's go to the live charts. And um, give me one second to get them uh, set up. A little blank chart going here. Okay. Um, let's take a look at the overall market. And then we'll drill down to um, sectors and take a look at your, your stocks. So uh, if you have some stocks you want me to discuss, please uh, start asking about them now. Remember, one at a time, hit enter, and then we'll go from there. Let's take a look at the P's. Um, as you can see, I've got a little sideways arrow drawn in here, or now it's a sideways arrow. So shorter term, the S&P 500 has been trading sideways for quite a while. In fact, you can go all the way back to when, let's say, what day was that? The 13th. Okay, so now we've got one month and a few days of complete sideways action. Uh, by the way, as I often preach, never forget about the net-net price change. I just tend to eyeball it, draw a line. But in Telechart, you can actually hit your C key and drag it forward, okay? So since December 13th, a little over a month ago, the market is down 0.15%. So for all intents and purposes, it hasn't done anything. If it goes up a little bit while we're having this presentation, it'll be flat for a month and, what, three days? Okay. But that's okay. Now, why is that okay? Dave, I thought you are a trend follower. It's going sideways. It's okay because we had this pretty big run from the November lows in here, and now the market's just sort of consolidating its gains. And what happens is markets, when a market takes off, they're in a state of disequilibrium because people aren't agreeing upon prices. There's a, a supply and a demand issue. Obviously, if a market is headed higher, as it is or has been here since November, then the, the disequilibrium is supply. Now we're in a state of equilibrium. And the reason that's okay is because prices begin to adjust to these higher levels. And as uh, a friend of mine used to once say, a market needs time to digest its gains. And hopefully that's what it's doing now before we have another leg higher. Um, I know it's fun to get in these markets and have them go parabolic once you're in them. But that's just not 
a longer term reality and that's why these shorts uh, these day trading shorts like to short those parabolic moves I would encourage you not to do that uh, I think it's exciting and fun until you get it caught in a short squeeze where you leverage your entire account plus some um, and you get into a lot of trouble but that's a story for another day but those sharp parabolic type of moves aren't sustainable. I'd much rather see a market go up, consolidate, bore you to death, and then start taking off again. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ looks a little bit better. We did have a little consolidation in here. This is kind of a, a micro sort of double top knockout. Not enough time to get into the pattern today since we're running a little late. But if you go back into YouTube, you can find it. And so far, we worked our way higher, eh, maybe today notwithstanding, but we're just off of all-time highs. S&P is only uh, like a half a percent or 30 percent off all-time high, so that's a good thing. Russell 2000, a little bit of a concern, okay, because this is a little bit representative of a couple things. The broader market, obviously, because it's 2000 stocks, and then also representative, more representative of the stocks we like to trade, the, the smaller cap in general type of stocks. So it's trading sideways. It's consolidating, but it is probing the bottom of its range. It's down about three-quarters percent today. So... I'm a little concerned about this, but I'm not going to sell the form. I'm going to do what? I'm going to honor my stops on existing positions just in case. And then I'm going to find some really good stocks, and I'm not going to trade if there are none. In the last couple of weeks, I don't think we had any recommendations on them. Not, not too many. We had one yesterday, Trigger, a day before, I forget. Um, I try not to obsess too much over the trades. But you can see that... We did sell off a little. We were pushing the bottom of the range. So we're just going to have to honor our stops on our positions just in case. And sometimes your stocks will defy gravity. If you bail out on them, I don't want to get into a micromanagement lesson because we're running late here. But as I often preach, if you bail out on them at the first sign of adversity, then you're never going to capture those longer-term trends. And then how many times has this market over the years shaken out and turned around and going right back up? Okay, One time it won't. That I can guarantee but we won't know that time until after the fact. But each day brings us new clues. Like, for instance, take a look at the bow ties in here. The 10 days moving down or turned down. And then, as I often preach, when the close drops below an exponential moving average, again, something I learned from the, from the app to people, uh, what happens? Well, the moving average will turn with it. So we could get a bow tie down on the daily Russell 2000. It's not going to be the end of the world, but we certainly might want to sit on our hands on new long positions when that occurs. We might consider a few short positions if that occurs, especially if it occurs at like the S&P, which I'd much rather short a, a bigger cap stock than a smaller cap stock. See the report on um, efficiency versus inefficiencies for more on that. I, I tend to like to short more efficient stocks. Anywho, uh, if we do bow tie down here, that would be a little cause for concern, but it wouldn't necessarily be the end of the world. So you have to take things one day at a time and not get too caught up in the emotions of things. And, and, and as I said earlier, I was like, oh, geez, you know, here we go again. Are we getting ready to roll over in this market? I noticed my positions are beginning to erode this week. Uh, I hope this is not the start of something new. Well, you can't. You can't figure all that out at one point. The great thing about the future, and I think Abraham Lincoln said this, is that it comes at you one day at a time. And you might want to write that down. As a trend follower, you don't want to try to anticipate. I know there's people out there saying, well, I expect the market to go down. Uh, I expect the market to go up 10% this year, 10% next year. It's like, how do you know? You don't know, okay? But as a trend follower, you can follow along if it does. And it's hard to put your ego aside and just follow along, but that's the thing to do. Let's take a look at the energies in here. You can see energies uh, off a little bit uh, in here, uh, getting kind of sideways. So you might just want to sit on your hands a little bit on those guys. Longer term trend still intact, but it's okay for a market to, to go up, base a little, go up, base a little, go up, base a little, go up, base a little. That's a lot more sustainable. It's kind of like that CNX that were long. And we've been long since last February, way back here, okay? But, Dave, that doesn't look like a trend now. Well, so what? We get stopped out, we get stopped out. But so far, it's gone up, based a little, gone up, based a little, gone up, based a lot, okay? Gone up, and then 
back to basing again. If we could survive this consolidation and it takes off again, then we might really have a nice longer term trade. Now, I wouldn't jump in midstream and buy the stock now, but you're already long, you're already in longer term trend following mode. You're in a completely different mindset than if you were seeing this for the first time. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Uh, energy's losing a little steam, but um, still in a longer term decent uptrend, as you can see. Metals and mining uh, probing new multi-year highs yesterday, coming back in a little bit and then pulling back a little bit today. Um, I'd like to see more upside follow through. I'd like to see them clear this base more decisively. But longer term, they still remain constructive, constructive in here. Uh, the gold stocks, I'm not too crazy about going after the gold stocks because they, they kind of they're kind of at mid levels in here based on this peak and this bottom here. I'd much rather them, as you can see, I've got a drawn in here when they're coming off of these major, major lows. I'd almost prefer if the gold stocks went down and made all time lows down here and then bottomed out and took off again. I'd be more excited to go after them. So the point I'm making is it's not time to go after the gold stocks. Somebody asked me that for last week's presentation and I think week before. And then it's a little bit more exacerbated in the, if that's the word, in the silver stocks because they've had quite a run. And now they're kind of in the middle of their range uh, bouncing around. So I would actually, there's two things they would have to do. Either one, go down to new lows, make new lows, bottom out, and then, then form transitional patterns. And that's because the most amount of people would be on the wrong side of the market if that happened. Or go on to new highs and then we just go back to trend following mode. Uh, the banks have lost a little steam as of late, too. You can see they were at brand new highs just a few days ago. Now they're coming back in a little bit. Financial, same sort of thing. And I've been a bull in the financials and banks, but now I'm beginning to pull my horns in a little bit while things are beginning to shake out. We have some positions working or, or not working as lately a little bit, but that's okay. We'll just see how uh, it shakes out. But there's no reason to rush out and buy any financial stocks right now. And again, Notice that you're moving average or, or beginning to come down. Now, keep in mind, as I often preach, and I borrowed this from Linda Rasky, markets will often do what they have to do to frustrate the most and to confuse the most. So it sure looks like they're rolling over at this particular point in time. Uh, but I wouldn't sell the form just yet. It might just be the mother of all shakeouts, okay? But it does. I would definitely sit on my hands, and I wouldn't get too excited about new positions here unless you thought you had the mother of all positions. Uh, some areas like retail still kind of meandering around. Uh, overall, it doesn't look horrible, but when you drill down to some subsectors here, uh, smaller subsectors like uh, obviously the apartment stores, you certainly don't want to be buying that at this juncture. Let's take a look at bonds real quick and then we need to hop out to the overall market. Uh, bonds, the good thing about bonds is they, they're kind of bottoming out in here and it hasn't been a route lower. Back here in November, I was a little concerned because it looked like it was going to be a route lower. You see you've got a bit of a bottom here, and it looks like it might have to go back and test their old lows. Getting whacked fairly hard today, but I wouldn't get too excited about that just yet. But again, the good news here is now we're getting a little bit of a base to work with. Not that you want to rush out and buy and or sell bonds, but just sit tight and let's just see how it shakes out. Eventually bonds will go higher, and hopefully they'll do so in a manner where stocks can sustain the higher rates. And we can have both rising rates and rising stocks, which would be nice. Um, the problem with intermarket technical analysis, I often preach, is that there's long lead and lag cycles. And then it only matters when it matters. So you, don't, you can't necessarily trade stocks off of bonds and vice versa. But you have to take it all into consideration. And then eventually there's going to be a relationship between those two. So read all the books. Uh, read... Murphy's Intermarket Technical Analysis. Uh, Pring does a lot of good um, work on, he has a really good, I don't know where you'd find it, but it's probably on the internet. But he has a really good graphic that shows you how it all is intertwined with the, with the dollar and the bonds and everything. But again, be careful because there's long lead and lag cycles to that. And it only matters when it matters. So markets will get uh, connected and then they'll decouple for a while. And it seems like it worked better years ago than it does now. Okay, Shiva says, I would like your comparison between CDIV and Kim for my eyes. Both were losing momentum before some sort of TKO. You took Kim, but advised me against CDIV. I would like to understand the differences so I can learn from this. Okay, uh, Kim is actually in the open portfolio. And I can't show you the spreadsheet because we do have a, a, a position working for today. 
So Kim is, let's sort these by real time, see what's happening. So Kim is actually right here, you can see. Now, his question is Kim versus C diff. So that's Kim. Let's take a look at C diff. It will bring it back and forth and do the comparisons. Okay. Um, C diff sort of took off in here. Okay. And then it kind of went like that. Okay. So that's when you email me, I'm, I'm guessing you email me back here. You email me to say, hey, what about C diff? And I said, it looks like it's losing some momentum. And you can kind of draw a little, if you want to draw it, kind of a wedge type of action. And notice that it had a gap, and then it had this huge wide range bar, and then it just kind of, it kind of just puttered higher. I hate to throw any indicators in here to confuse you, but I'd be, I'd be willing to bet some sort of oscillator might help to, um, to show this, what, what I have learned to just eyeball over the years. And, and I don't want to do that because I don't use indicators other than the occasional moving average. But you can see, and the other thing too, is it really didn't clear this prior peak by that much. And then the knockout move really wasn't that much of a knockout move, okay? So that's why I, I didn't like that one. Let's go back to the chem now and let's do a little comparison. If you look at the chem, now I guess the confusion might be the short term versus the longer term. Uh, if you look at the chem, it's been in a really steady uptrend and a really persistent uptrend, okay? And it looks like there's a little acceleration in that. Now, you might be thinking, well, Dave, it looks like it, it lost a little steam, but that's okay. Just a short-term loss of steam, in fact, that kind of gives you that double top knockout move. And a case like this, what you have to look at is that it went from here to here, and this is your new high. So that's a significant move. Let's measure that, and it's going to be close to 79%. So, yeah, I hear you. It did slow down a little bit in here, but that's the that's kind of the basis of a double top knockout. You want it to fake out some people with a double top knockout pattern. So let's take a look at that. I think double top knockout was in my first book. Uh, take a look at the video, which shouldn't be too buried behind the, the additional comments on my website, and watch the one on TKOs. But a double top knockout, what we're looking for is we're looking for a market and a strong trend to make a minor double top. And then ideally you want this peak to be higher than this peak. And then you want some sort of knockout type of move to shake some people out. And so those eager shorts will think, oh, yeah, that's a top. I'm going to short the, the mess out of this stock. And then when the stock turns around, goes right back up, it squeezes them out. So that's what I was looking at in the Kemet. And again, in your mind's eye, there's this nice really solid trend here. It lost a little steam in here, but if you go back to that C dev, it took off and then it lost steam. Also, when you look at these trends, how many days is really in that trend? You've got one big gap here and then one gap plus a wide range bar. So you've got a two day trend, sort of, or two days encompasses the majority of the pop higher and then it began to drift, okay? So hopefully that makes sense and uh, let me know if not. But yeah, thanks for bringing up the show because sometimes these things are hard to, um, a picture's worth a thousand words. Yeah, I, Phil, I forgot to mention that. I, I knew Phil was gonna, gonna bring up the 50. And I usually only plot the 50 when either A, Phil uh, makes me, or B, when, um, when the market gets in trouble. I always like to see where the 50 is, when the market starts to stall out a little bit. But usually I don't bother uh, plotting it. And Phil's a big fan of the market consolidating down to its 50-day moving average, and that's fine. Um, nothing wrong with using that as a reference point. But, yeah, I hear you. And I meant to, to pull it up earlier, so thanks for the reminder on that, Phil. Appreciate it. All right, I lost my questions for a second. Let me find them again. You know, talk amongst yourselves. Oh, I lost them. Oh, here we go. I don't know how to get them back to a window. Shoot. All right, here we go. All right, see a fat finger or something. Okay, Craig says, C to have 19 days of lost momentum. Yeah, I agree. And again, I want to stop you short of plotting an indicator because I eyeball these things. But if you are going to use an indicator, use them as an illustrator to show you what's actually happening in a chart. 
And that's why I take take it for instance, take a look at the moving averages here. Well, I, I didn't plot the bow ties here until I saw the stock go sideways. This is the Russell once again. I didn't plot the bow tie until I saw it go sideways for a month or so, month and a half. And then it's like, well, you know, I better see what's going on with those moving averages. But if you're a little newer to trading and you don't quite have that eye yet, then by all means, plot the moving averages and say, oh, wait a minute. The moving averages are headed higher back here. Now they're headed sideways. Now they're turning over a little bit. So now we know this market is losing steam. Okay. So anything that kind of helps you to pay attention to what's happening in prices, and I know Mr. Phil is a big fan of the 50-day moving average, so we could certainly put that back in there. And if that helps you kind of get an idea of what's going on, like, oh, okay, it looks like we're still in an uptrend, but we have lost some steam in here, so maybe we just need to back off a little bit about being super-duper aggressive until we start seeing new highs again. And then if we do make the bow tie, burst below that 50, and then come back and stall out at the 50 or just fail to go to new highs, then maybe we need to start shorting, okay? But as a trend follower, you don't know. You have to just wait. Okay, Rick wants to know about CHKR. Clean chart up, CHKR. Uh, it's a little too thin, a lot too thin. It's kind of penny stockish. So I would leave that one alone um, just based on the on the, the float. I mean, look at that, 300 and uh, not much shares are traded, okay, especially for a cheaper stock. I hear you, though. I mean, it certainly has bottomed out. I mean, this is the kind of stock I like, especially in a commodity-related stock. I like something that comes down and makes these these lows at or near these all-time lows, begins a rally. So it looks okay, but it's just way too thin to be trading, okay? And you can see it, it does – looks like it trades with a big spread, and, and so I would avoid it. But I hear what you're saying. It has a bit of a, um, a Phoenix stock look, meaning that it looks like it could rise from the ashes. Brett wants to know about EXTN. EXTN. Uh, yeah, that looks good. Um, and now, see, we were just talking with uh, Shiva about acceleration versus deceleration. And see, you've got a nice trend here. It did consolidate a little bit in here, but now you have a nice trend again. So you can look at this line and this line, and this one's actually a little bit sharper than this. So you definitely want to see some sort of acceleration and trend. Another way to draw that would be, uh, I call it accelerating momentum strategy. And you don't have to be too perfect with these trend lines, although in this case it works out just perfectly. Notice you connect the lows in here. It almost does perfectly to right here. Hey, guess what? Hey, Phil, you know what that is probably? I bet it's a 50. Nope, not quite. Okay, didn't even, it didn't retrace to the 50. But anyway, you could see that um, in this particular case, it consolidated a little bit, and now it's accelerating higher. So when you connect the dots, it looks like that. And that's what I call accelerating momentum strategy. This is what an accelerating market looks like. Yeah, it accelerated a little bit in the meantime, but it pretty much held the longer-term trend line. So what do, you, what do you do now? Well, put this one on your watch list. It's, it's quite thin, okay? It's a little thin, uh, but it looks like it's tradable. It's up around 30 bucks a share, so it's at okay volume uh, if you do volume by price. But wait for a trend knockout move. That would be the ideal pattern here or possibly uh, some other form of pullback. But absolutely, uh, put that one on your watch list. Uh, hey, Craig, uh, NVDA, I think that's lost a little momentum. Let's take a look at it. Um, it was, it, it kind of took off and then it obviously consolidated. Then it kind of took off again. So it looked okay a while back. If you go back in the Landry list, when you look at those delayed services, you'll see that I had this one on my list. But now it's lost a little steam because you made a new high. Now you have one, two, three, four. Let's zoom in on this. Now you have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 50, 16 days. So another four days, and that's what, a month's worth of trading without making new highs. Usually in a pullback, I like to see them pull back for several days to maybe eight days most. So now it has begun to lose some steam. And then if you wanted to look a little bit longer term, you could say, well, wait a minute. It hasn't made any forward progress in about a month, okay? Even though it looks fantastic longer term, it's lost. It's, you know, markets are like Janet Jackson says, you know, what have you done for me lately? So that's why this came off the Landry list, okay? Uh, Jim, I'm going to stay away from that one just because it is on my Landry list today, speaking of which. Brett wants to talk about S&D. We're, uh, we're long this particular stock right now. Now, this one didn't have a tremendous knockout move, but it was an IPO, and it was in a nice persistent uptrend, and that's why I liked it, okay? Uh, so put that one on your watch list. As a new position, wait for it to hit new highs and then start pulling back again. 
but definitely put it. Okay, it is room to room to move, Dave. Uh, I forget which one we're talking about, Craig. Uh, Brett, we can't talk about that one because that is the stock of the day. Congratulations, that was the one that I just showed in the uh, thing. But you'll see that if it triggers, you'll see that uh, next week in the delayed service. But good job on that one. Uh, good eye, congratulations, high five, first high five of the day. That uh, stock that was trending was a high five too, but it's just not set up. So you only get high fives for trending stocks. Yeah, we talked about this one last week. This was an IPO breakout pattern not long ago. You can see these IPOs, selected ones at least, are really working well. The great thing nowadays, or more recent times, is the demarcation between the good IPOs and the bad IPOs is, is really great. It's like they either come out and die now or they come out and take off. And that's why we've been enjoying these IPOs so much. But, yeah, put that on your watch list. Uh, we talked about that one last week. It's definitely a good-looking stock. Brett, you're doing a good job. I'm impressed. Uh, yeah, S&D, we just covered that one, Brett. Uh, Quaba? Q-A-B-A. -A. We'll have to go to lightning round. We'll run out of time. Okay, um, here's, a, here's a case of losing steam, okay? And here's a good example on a multitude of levels. So I think Shiva had to go back to uh, what he was doing. He had to walk away. But hopefully he'll watch the um, – uh, rerun, rerun of this. You could see it took off here. And then here was still headed higher, but remember, we like to see this followed by this. Okay? Uh, was it Frankenstein? This good. Okay? And then it did begin to accelerate a little bit higher here, so it kind of got its act together again. So that makes it a little tricky because it went straight up here and then it, it, it kind of drifted higher. And then it didn't quite go straight up, but it did make a decent move higher. So that's a little tricky as far as acceleration is concerned, but it is sort of decelerating. But now we have another clue, and the other clue is the fact that if you go back to December, early December, fairly early December, we're now lower than we were back then. Well, Dave, isn't that a pullback? Don't you like pullbacks? Yeah, but look at how many days, okay? That's quite a few days of the pullback, so it definitely has lost some steam in here. So I would leave that one alone, okay? So that tells you that these banks could be in a little trouble. Now, if you can't eyeball that and see that the trend went from this to this, then by all means, throw in those moving averages, okay? And what are they doing? Well, your 10 has crossed below the 20, and it's on its way towards the 30, and the 20 is also on its way towards the 30, and they both turn down, being exponential. When the price goes below them, what do they do? They turn down, okay? So looks like we're losing some momentum on that. NNA, that's going to be a shipper. Sound like chipper. Are you afraid of one chipper? Um, it's a little wide and loose, but these shippers can be kind of crazy. Um, shippers tend to be choppy and tough to trade, but it's not like I won't. But they still could be tradable at times. My only concern here is we really didn't get past these prior peaks. I get rid of these moving averages. Ideally, I like to see a market bust out past a prior peak and then begin to pull back. So I think I would pass based on uh, that situation. I hear you though. It looks like a big picture bottom. You know, maybe buy it at a dollar ninety-two and use a dollar ninety-five stop. Okay. <laughs> Impact. Impact. Um, HV a little high, not too high, but let's take a look at the actual stock. Uh, this was a little tricky. It took off, and then you do have that acceleration higher, but then it kind of knocked out. I think it looks okay, but it's super volatile. I mean, if you did go after it, I know this is going to sound absolutely crazy, but maybe an entry around 14, okay, believe it or not, and then your stop would have to be below 10. Now, it doesn't look like a lot. If you take the scaling out, I almost put my hand on the chart. That's kind of stupid, but... uh. Such an idiot. Uh, but if you take the scaling out, it looks decent, right? But when you actually put the scaling back in, you can see that that would be a very ridiculous stop that it would take. Uh, but, yeah, it looks okay for a very, 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 very aggressive type of trade. Also, very thin stock, so be careful on that. I think it would pass based on those two reasons. But certainly um, good-looking stock on, a, on an absolute basis or in and of itself.
Okay, we're gonna have to wrap it up. It just we got time for like one or two more. A T K R for Brett. We'll probably go ahead and wrap it up. Yeah, Brett. Again, good eye on this one. Uh, put this in your watch list. It's a little wide and loose in here, but you can see it's beginning to get its act together. Okay, and it does have the makings of okay, we're like a longer term gradual trend. Nothing to do here, but now it's beginning to happen. It's beginning to accelerate higher. So uh, absolutely, put that in your watch list. And uh, ideally, I like to see it accelerate higher a little bit more, maybe up to 28 or so, and then on a pullback. But by all means, again, put that on your watch list. Well, look, uh, I better go ahead and wrap things up. The recordings get a little hard to manage after about an hour and a half. Uh, I have a blast doing these shows. Thank you guys for hanging out the whole time. Uh, any unanswered questions, you know, team Dave, Dave, Landry.com. If we don't talk again between now and then, everyone have a fantastic weekend. And I guess uh, hopefully we'll see all you guys and girls again on Thursday. If, um, we're talking on Thursday, if not sooner. Thank you so much.